ואני מתכבדת להזמין את הדובר השני, פרופסור ויצ'רד לנדס. פרופסור ויצ'רד לנדס הוא פרופסור להיסטוריה מאוניברסיטת בוסטון. עיקר התמחותו, עד כמה שאני הבנתי, אני מקווה שאני הבנתי נכון, הוא בחקר הזיקה בין תרבות לבין השימוש שתרבות עושה במדיה בכלל ובימינו בניו מדיה, הבנתי נכון? אוקיי, okay, בסדר. ונהניתי לראות את התובנה ש... שלך לגבי הדמיון בין הקשר שהפרוטסט... השימוש שעשה הפרוטסטנטיזם בדפוס לבין השימוש שהג'יהאד עושה באינטרנט. אוקיי, uh-huh. okay, okay. קיבלתי כבר פעמיים אישור, אז זה כבר בסדר. Uh, ואני חושבת שמחקריו יותר ויותר מובילים אותו לכיוון של חקירת הקשר בין הג'יהאד העולמי לבין השימוש במדיה החדשה, בעיקר באינטרנט, במסגרת הלוחמה התעמולתית, הקוגניטיבית שלו, על מסגור הקוגניציה של המערב במלחמתו אה, במזרח התיכון, ולא רק במזרח התיכון. שם ההרצאה שלו כל כך ארוך שאני אקח לו דקה חבל על הזמן, אז בבקשה, פרופסור לנדס. אני מעדיף לדבר באנגלית. אוקיי. אז... Okay. Um, and I'll be speaking about the mainstream news media, not the internet media. As I researched this paper, it became clear that my main claim, that the mainstream news media relies heavily on NGOs and its coverage of any conflict in which the Israeli army fights with its neighbors, was too obvious. Granted, material from Operation Cast Lead, which is what I'll be using, weights my findings. not allowed into Gaza, the Western press necessarily depended on other sources, Palestinian stringers, officials from UNRWA, and various NGOs, thus making dependence on NGOs more pronounced during Operation Cast Lead than any other conflict. I could fill my 20 minutes with one example after another of how the mainstream news media turned to, quote, human rights NGOs, for information, how the NGO reps ignored the question posed in order to make their case against Israel, how rather than challenge these statements, the mainstream news media interviewers gave them a free platform, and how much inform- misinformation entered the information circulation system as a result. Instead, I'd like to select my examples. There will be examples of everything I just said, but I'd like to select them according to a specific thesis. One first enunciated formally by Stuart Green in his path-breaking thesis for Washington's Joint Military Intelligence College in Washington, D.C. in 2007 entitled Cognitive Warfare. I think in Israel we refer to it as uh, uh, Lochemet I'm not sure if that's exactly the same thing, but you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. In which he pointed out how Hamas and all Arab groups who fight Israel use military conflict primarily as a way to score victories in a cognitive war, which the Israelis tend to ignore, just like Um Shmum. Indeed, as a moment's thought will reveal, in any so wildly asymmetrical war, as the kinetic, the military battlefield between, say, Hamas and Israel, the main efforts of the weak side, in this case Hamas, obviously look for other theaters of war in which to fight. In this thesis, Green documented the critical role that the mainstream news media plays in the success of this strategy. This is obviously a controversial, indeed many might say tendentious claim, and most critics of the mainstream news media who wish to maintain some semblance of a serious mainstream reputation would avoid anything so categorical as to say that the mainstream news media knowingly or unknowingly is basically the tool of Hamas or anti-Zionist cognitive warfare. But being a historian, medieval historian to boot, I go not where my concerns for how I appear take me, but follow the evidence. In what follows, I want to make the following claims, which I believe more extensive research will corroborate, refine, and elucidate. One, Hamas's cognitive war strategy in a case like Operation Cast Lead consists of 
survive while mobilizing international pressure on Israel to stop before it can destroy them. And the means to get the international community to intervene comes from the ability to incite outrage at the humanitarian catastrophe that Israel's actions are bringing on. This strategy depends on the mainstream news media to work. Without their cooperation, conscious or unwitting, Hamas's grand narrative of Israeli-caused humanitarian catastrophe, which they nobly resist, and whose only resolution comes from stopping the Israeli military actions, could not become part of a news and news commentary cycle. In order for this to work, the mainstream news media must at once pass on as accurate Hamas claims and suppress any evidence to the contrary, or most evidence to the contrary, and I'll return to this point at the end of my talk. Without such a double operation, it would be almost impossible to reach the th outrage threshold to international intervention, and certainly in comparison with the outrage threshold that uh, is reached by the international community in other conflicts in the Middle East, say our neighbors in Syria, much less reach it fast enough to save an organization like Hamas. And the third point is that human rights NGOs and UN agencies are crucial to the process whereby journalists recirculate Hamas talking points as news. A word of caution before proceeding, when you see the lopsided nature of the footage I'm about to show you, you justifiably can wonder whether I haven't cherry-picked my examples to suit my bias. All I can say is I'd welcome I'd welcome a quantitative study of the patterns involved to determine whether or just how accurate or inaccurate my general assessment of the larger over, overall trend is. So let's start with Jeremy Bowen, the first day of Operation Cast Lead in the London studios before he comes to uh, uh, be on site in the Middle East, explaining to Peter Dobby, who was the um, anchor for the first days, what, this, what the game is, what the dance is. Oh no, tell me. Tell me this ain't so Mr. Natural. Uh, recommended settings. Finish importing media library. Is Bill Gates part of the conspiracy? Um, Bill Gates? No, more like. Uh, here we go. Now let me start that again. Primarily. Okay, and the next uh, thing I have my computer, I didn't transfer it, is Christiana Amanpour, who does the dance as she interviews Peter uh, uh, Tony Blair in Jerusalem, and she says, well, now that Israel's going in on the ground, there are obviously going to be more civilian casualties. How long can Israel hold out, given the outrage these... Uh, um, these, uh, these casualties will cause. All right, knowing this, Hamas's strategy consists of magnifying outrage against Israel as quickly as possible. As one Gazan explained to the Italian journalist Lorenzo Cremesoni, an Italian reporter who defied the Israelis and snuck into Gaza during the hostilities, the Hamas, and this is a Gazan speaking to the reporter, the Hamas militants look for good places to provoke the Israelis. They're usually youth, 16, 17 years old. The rest of them are under Shifa, armed with submachine guns. They couldn't do anything against a tank or a jet. They knew they were much weaker, but, and here's the um, money uh, quote, they wanted the Israelis to shoot at the civilians' houses so they could accuse them of war crimes. For Hamas, the game is a win either way. The sooner the Israelis stop, the sooner they can resume their, their previous ways. The longer the Israelis go on, the more dead children will prepare future war crimes. Their cannibalistic strategy in pursuit of a cognitive war victory, a kind of negative sum win-win, is the dirty secret that they want none to discuss. 
It would undermine the outrage. If one considers the cognitive war theater of battle in Operation Cast Lead, one of the key fights concern the status of Hamas in the peace process. The Israeli position, tacitly and even at points dramatically supported by the position of more moderate Arab leaders, including the PLO, was that Hamas was to blame for this current state of affairs. It was a dangerous rogue state whose exclusion would serve the interests of peace, both for Israelis and Palestinians. Hamas's answer was that nothing could come between them and the valiant people who would be willing to sacrifice and withstand anything for the honor and religion of Hamas. And here is Israel. Uh, That was awful. Did you understand that? Uh, can you turn up the sound? All right, in other words, we're willing to put up with anything. Faced with the he said, she said of the positive sum win-win Israeli-Palestinian civil society and the negative sum win-win of Hamas destroy or be destroyed, what did the MSN, or the mainstream news media do? One might be excused for thinking that after laying out the two positions, journalists from a culture that prizes positive sum win-wins would find ways to seek out and broadcast moderate voices. After all, it's pretty basic that if your own people are suffering because you keep rocketing the neighbors and the neighbors promise to stop if you'll stop, it's something of a no-brainer to stop. No-brainer for us, maybe but not for those whose honor at resisting an evil enemy that must be destroyed means more than the welfare of their own people. And indeed, for someone for whom the sacrifice of his own civilians is a war aim, it's a no-brainer the other way. So when BBC anchor, a BBC anchor pops the question to the Arab League ambassador to the UN, Yahya Mamasani, his answer might strike some of us as totally illogical. I'm asking you, the Arab League Ambassador, about, about the Palestinian side of this conflict. I mean, somebody in this conflict needs to take the first step. And when Hamas sees the consequences that you clearly mentioned there for its own people, why does it not simply stop its rocket fire? Israel has said all along, if it does, they can have a ceasefire in two hours. How can those rockets stop when the sky is raining? Bombs and rockets, when everything on the ground is scorched earth policy, everything is burnt people, human beings, and even the stones. How can this stop? Israel must stop the work of its brutal, vicious military machine. In other words, the real point is Israel is evil. Keep your eyes on the Israeli caused scorched earth of Gaza. This almost embarrassing behavior is further mediated by NGO-refined post-colonial discourse. Here, for example, is Isam Yunus, director of a Palestinian NGO allegedly dedicated to human rights, although it has no record of denouncing the abuse of Palestinians as human shields by Hamas, for example. Um, so Ralitsa Vasileva poses the question. Uh, to, to talk to them about stopping those rocket attacks. Israel is saying 
that this action will continue until the rocket attacks stop. Have you been in contact with Hamas leadership to do something about this? So his response is to put it in the framework of the occupation. Notable in these interviews with Palestinians, whether government officials or NGOs, is how the interviewees ignore the questions. No matter how poor, how little the interviewers interrupt them, no matter how poor the questions, how little the interviewers interrupt them, how mild the challenges. Here, BBC's du Lee's Doucet interviews Osam Ahmed from Al Haq Human Rights Organization in Ramallah, whom she questions about Gaza rather than Ramallah. Mind you, at the time, Ramallah was an interesting place because the PA was not supporting Hamas. So there must have been all sorts of very interesting news from Ramallah, but instead she asks him about what's going on in Gaza, which she can't know any better than she can. Five minutes? Let's go down to the West Bank city of Ramallah. We can join Osama Ahmed, who's from the Palestinian Human Rights Group, Al Haq. Osama Ahmed, I know you've been monitoring the situation closely. Just exactly how much damage has been caused in the Gaza Strip after five days of Israeli airstrikes? Well, first of all, I want to wish a happy new year to those that are standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people in London and around the world because it's going to be their uh, work on their capital that's going to lead to changing policy and pressuring Israel from their capital. So, in other words, this is him giving a shout out to all the people who are working to make this policy of um, uh, getting international outrage to stop Israel. The, the destruction that has occurred in Gaza is uh, immeasurable. It's, uh, it's unbelievable the amount of damage that has been caused over the past five days by Israel's uh, relentless attacks on the civilian population. You get the point. Uh, I'm running out of time. Let me give you, this is so, he's in Ramallah. Here we have another human rights NGO in, um, in Washington, D.C., uh, a guy named Badawi. Now, the problem with all of this, of course, is that uh, we are facing a situation in which the people of Gaza have been in prison for the past 18 months, and before that, for 41 years, I think it's very important to remember the context of this. There is an Israeli occupation which did not end in 2005. The Israel is essentially sealed off a million and a half people, a million of whom are refugees registered in the UN for the Torah Savings. This has been. He ends up by saying, uh, and this is just, anybody who denies this is lying. Um, now, th those are Palestinian NGOs. Here's a Western NGO, Oliver McTiernan, who's asked about the situation. That's Peter Dobby. And McTiernan is a member of uh, the, I think, the director of Forward Thinking, a liaison group that does things like spend Swiss money giving Hamas policemen training in emergency management, and he does his piece for the narrative, which is essentially saying that excluding Hamas is wrong-headed, the recurring mistake of Israel, her ally, and even the European Union. Or with thinking, I think, which the easiest between opposing factions in Gaza. Given the events today, how do you unpick where we are and go back to something that could maybe turn into some sort of truth, or is that a possibility? All right, and then he goes in to talk about uh, the importance of including Hamas. Um, Tiernan, I'll give you an idea of the value of what he's got to say. Because we work very closely with the Israeli Knesset, and I'm not talking now about the peacemakers of the Knesset, I'm talking about the right wing of the Knesset, and every single person there would have said over the past year, we can only reach a solution to this conflict if we engage with Hamas. There was a, the realism is. Okay, so 
What ends up coming out of this is the meme backfire. In other words, Israeli policy trying to separate the moderates from the radicals, trying to peel off the PA and other moderate uh, regimes in the Middle East from uh, Hamas radicals is going to backfire. And so you, you'll see this meme because once it catches, watch Ra Ralitsa Vasileva use this with um, Sipi Could it push moderates like the Palestinian Authority have called for a ceasefire uh, to move towards Hamas. We see protests all over the Arab world. Could it backfire? We see also rockets being fired further deeper into Israel. Today, an Israeli man was killed. But I do believe fully that what we are doing serves the interest of all the moderates in the region and the entire Palestinian people as well as Israel, uh, as well as Israelis. That's a good uh, positive sum argument. Now we get uh, Ralitza turning to Diana Butu and asking her opinion. And you'll see the quality of the thinking with Diana Butu, who, like so many of these people, is asked one question and answers with her talking points. I spoke with the foreign minister of Israel, Tzipi Levy, and asked her if what Israel is doing right now will backfire on the moderates or those who want to achieve peace with Israel. And she said that what uh, Israel was doing right now was going to help the moderates. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. First speaker, we're short. Sure. It's been proven time and again that, that violence only gets more violence. What is the sentiment there to move? All right, so this is, we can skip this. this. So this is, so we can skip this. Everybody's together. Okay, so now this is interesting. This is interesting because this is, um, what's her name, uh, uh, Zainab Badawi. And essentially she is attacking the Arab League representative for not bringing Hamas and uh, Fatah together. She is more pro-Hamas than he is. Uh, Hamas are there with Fatah sitting together, trying to sort out a joint result to Israel. Isn't it a matter of urgency? Okay. All right, I'm going to stop this because I'm running out of time. Um, just <laughs> please excuse me. Um, OK, so here. Richard, it's my time you're killing. Uh, well, we had a shorter talk to start with. Um, here, I think this is, I'll skip to this one. This is to give you an idea of what happens when an Israeli talking point is being made. This is how uh, the media responds. Well, presumably, if you're going to carry out an aerial bombardment in one of the most densely populated places on Earth, uh, you're going to get civilian casualties, and your government presumably calculated that and decided this was a price uh, they were prepared to pay. I think that if you compare this operation to other operations, for example, NATO bombardment of Serbia, you will observe that uh, there are inevitably collateral damages, and the only question is how many collateral damages as opposed to uh, targets uh, being struck. And I think that uh, in Serbia, when uh, the NATO had to fight not terrorists, but the Serbian army, there were collateral damages, there were damages among civilians. Not quite on this scale, I have to say. Not on this scale. But, uh, because the attack, because what they had to face was not on this scale, the Serbians were not firing rockets over British or French or... or well, yes, and it wasn't as densely populated. Anyway, that's all we've got time for. Mr. Powell, <laughs> Okay. Now, I'm going to skip the uh, rest of, I have no more footage. I'm going to, I'm jumping to the conclusion, I'm skipping a couple of examples of other sidelining, not just of Israeli, for instance, Kremasoni came back and none of the um, press, none of the newspapers wanted to interview him. He came back saying, I saw empty hospitals, uh, I, I interviewed lots of Hamas, lots of Gazans who were hostile to Hamas, nobody was interested. The result of this somewhat inexplicably self-destructive, not to mention professionally unethical behavior, I would contend is a literal inversion of reality in which people, depending on our mainstream news media for an accurate take on the scene, really have no idea what's actually going on in this conflict, no sense of the players or the dynamics, but rather a horribly dumbed down, self-lacerating morality tale in which Israel is the guilty aggressor and the Palestinians the innocent victims. And while this may fit nicely into the worldviews of many people around the world and possibly some of you in this room, no matter how good it makes you feel, it's divorced from a much more dangerous reality that we ignore at our own risk. 
And this is not only true for Jews like Gidon Levy, who enjoy lacerating their own people in public, but for the rest of the world, at least those who enjoy that particular spectacle of self-debasement. Civilizational suicide is committed by fo po follies such as these. If you're in a war zone and you can't reality test, you're in trouble. And when our, and here I speak on behalf of civil society the world over, when our mainstream news media, reporting from asymmetrical war zones, systematically misinform us about that reality, indeed become tools of cognitive warfare strategy of the enemies of civil society, then we, and that wondrous experiment in civic freedom which, in which we today participate, are most definitely in trouble. Thank you.